Hey guys, welcome. Hey guys, welcome to chapter four. This is medical terminology and abbreviations. This is actually going to be a pretty short and sweet lecture, um, but it is going to require basically just some practice on your half and reviewing some of the um, pages in your textbook to really get a good grasp on this. So we're going to talk about, oops, sorry, I always do that, um, how to recognize some of these medical prefixes, roots, and suffixes that are used to commonly build medical terms. Um, so we can start to familiarize yourself, start to get more comfortable with these medical terms. Uh, you're going to be running into these as, a lot as phlebotomists. You're going to need to know what they mean, as well as common medical abbreviations, and a lot of them that are specific to your role as a phlebotomist. Finally, we're going to talk a little bit about how we use medical terms to explain the body based on position, direction, and parts, and that's going to be important for you guys as well. So medical terminology. Um, Medical words are formed from Greek and Latin words. We don't tend to use these in our everyday dialogue, of course, but we do use them daily when we're communicating with other healthcare workers. Medical terminology helps us to identify diseases and affected areas of the body in a more precise and specific way. Uh, to learn medical terminology, though, you've got to have a basic understanding of word parts. So that's what we're going to talk about first right here. So the word root. This contains the base meaning of the word. And don't worry, we're going to use a lot of examples here in a minute. The suffix. This comes the end of the word, and it actually alters the meaning of the root word. The prefix comes at the beginning of a word and also alters the root. Combining vowels. This is used between a word root and the suffix to aid pronunciation. Um, this is usually an O. Okay, and so we're going to. I'm going to give you some examples. You've got cardiologist. Most of you have heard the word cardiologist before, so let's break it down. You've got cardi, that's heart, and you hear the, the word cardi. Um, o, that's where they've used that combining vowel to just kind of ease pronunciation. And logist, that's specialist in the knowledge of. So cardiologist, specialist in the knowledge of the heart, right? Pretty simple. Tachycardia, that's a condition of rapid heartbeat. Tacky meaning rapid, cardi meaning heart, which we already know, and the ia is a condition of, tachycardia, condition of rapid heart or heartbeat. Um, plastectomy, cost has to do with our ribs. Ectomy is a removal of, so costectomy, removal of the rib. Uh, neurectomy, we know, we know ectomy already, that's removal of. Ner is nerve, so if a neurectomy, removal of a nerve. Um, phlebotomy terminology, uh, you're going to be required to recognize and use medical terms every day. And I want to make sure that you please, please, please here review table 4-2 in your textbook. It's on pages 72 through 74. Again, there's only so much I can't really lecture on all of these examples. It's got to be you guys reviewing over, practicing, and getting familiar. It is some memorization of some of these root words, suffixes, and prefixes that build these medical words. All right, medical abbreviations. Um, medical abbreviations are used basically to be more efficient of both our time and space. Um, we're talking about the medical record, documentation, um, efficiency of communicating and talking. Phlebotomists need to be able to recognize common abbreviations and symbols related to specimens and various lab tests. The Joint Commission, so um, which we talked about before, be familiar with Joint Commission. Joint Commission and the Institute for Safe Medi Medication Practices have a list of abbreviations that should not be used. Um, this is due to the risk of misinterpretation and resulting errors that have occurred when these abbreviations have been used in the past. Um, your facility that you work at one day is going to have a list of approved abbreviations. Make sure you know that, you have that, and you're aware. Abbreviation mistakes can lead to negative effects for our patients. So when in doubt, spell it out. Don't forget that. When in doubt, spell it out. Um, and again, for this, please, please, please review table 4.3 in your textbook. It's on page 75. Oops, sorry, I meant to take that video off. Um, so let's talk a little bit about anatomical um, or anatomy and physiology first. So anatomy, this is the scientific study of body structure. This allows us to comprehend the normal position of the body structures. When we talk about physiology, we're talking about the study of the function of the body's organs and other structures. 
and they're always related. So anatomy and physiology, that's why you take anatomy and physiology classes, A and P, they always go together. Um, let me back up a bit. So you've got A and P, anatomy and physiology. We've also got physi pathophysiology. This is the study of, the dis of a disordered function. So this is important. Why you need to know what that is, is because it helps the phlebotomists understand the procedures they are performing and why you're performing them. Um, and you can have classes, again, we, we're familiar with A and P classes, and that means physiology, but as you advance in your career, if you choose to go into a more advanced um, practices, such as RN, you might be taking pathophysiology classes as well to have a better understanding of when things aren't going right in the body. So let's talk about the organization of the body a little bit. Um, and this is just going to be very simplistic. And then when we talk about our body systems, we'll go into more detail. But the atom. That is the simplest unit of all matter. Atoms are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Our body is made up of these things. Molecules, these are units of matter formed of at least two of those atoms, okay? So when two, two or more atoms get together, it forms a molecule. These can be proteins or carbohydrates, and then those molecules form to get or join together to form organelles. Um, organelles, uh, combine to form cells. So when we're talking about organelles combining to form cells, we're talking about things like leukocytes or neurons. Finally, or not finally, I shouldn't say that, cells, the next step. Uh, these are considered the smallest living unit of our body, okay? So we've got these atoms, these molecules, they're combining to form our cells. Cells combine then to form tissues. So you've got epithelial, nervous, and muscle, right? Epithelial tissues, um, or excuse me, um, yes, epithelial, these are covering of organs and linings of our body openings. So our skin, the inside of our mouth, these are all um, built on epithelial uh, tissues. Connective tissues, these are found in the bone and blood, and they help bind other tissues together. Nervous tissue, these are made up of nerve cells, right? Uh, they carry, carry messages to and from the body. Our muscle tissue, we can have voluntary and involuntary muscles. Um, voluntary muscle tissue is also called striated. And this is what, is what moves our skeleton. Involuntary or smooth muscles perform tasks automatically. These are the things we don't have to think about. Um, our cardiac muscle, our heart muscle, we don't have to think about it, it just does it for us, right? So that's an example. Voluntary, I think, oh, I want to reach for that cup of water right there. It's a voluntary movement. Okay, so we've got organ, or excuse me, we've got atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, and tissues. And then our tissues combine to form our organs. So like tissues combine, and it can be one type of tissue, or it could be two types of tissues, depending on the organ, but they come together to form an organ. Our pancreas, kidney, for example. Next step is our organs combining to form a system, okay? So that could be our integumentary system, skeletal, muscular system, lymphatic, immune, respiratory, digestive, nervous, endocrine, cardiovascular, cardiovascular, respiratory, I'm excuse me, I said respiratory, right? reproductive or urinary. So a lot of systems in our body. Our organs co combine together to form those particular systems. And then finally, the systems all combine in our body to form us, form an organism. So it could be us, humans, it could be animals, whatever that organism may be. Um, electrolytes are important to mention. Um, they are substances that release ions that can be either positively or negatively, ch negatively charged. And the reason it's important to mention electrolytes, you're gonna be drawing electrolytes a lot, that's, that's a commonly ordered lab. Um, they're critical because movement of these ions in and out of our body help to regulate and trigger a lot of the um, physio physiological states and activities of our body. Uh, electrolytes are also essential for fluid balance, um, sodium and water in particular, right? Sodium and water are, go hand in hand, they're buddies, right? So if sodium and water get out of balance, it's gonna affect, affect our fluid balance of our body. Another example is calcium and magnesium or other electrolytes. They kind of go together. They affect our muscles, whether they contract or relax. 
And then also electrolytes affect our nerve impulse conduction as well. So electrolytes are also important to kind of understand um, what their role is and what their function. So genetics, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that because that can be a topic that there is some, you know, there's, we're gonna talk about genetic testing. Some people don't, um, I'll, I'll put it this way. Sometimes there's some ethical discussion among genetics and genetic testing. Um, DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, are molecules that basically control the processes of human cell differentiation, growth, and development. They tell our cells what to do, how to behave. DNA, specifically, DNA holds our genetic code. It contains all of the information needed for our body processes, okay? RNA, these, uh, this assists the cell in trans translating the DNA messages and then prompts the cells to carry out a specific task, okay? So we need both of these working together for our body to proce um, process and function and perform as it should. So our genes are made up of sequences. That's what that image is down there. Our genes are just sequences of these DNA and RNA telling our body and our cells what to do, how to behave, and how to act and function. There are laboratory tests that can be done um, on DNA and RNA. You might see these done to check for paternity or genetic disorders. Um, genetic disorders are basically a disease that are caused by an altered gene. Um, many cancers are, are caused by altered genes um, or an altered group of genes but alter, alterations can do cause other things. We'll talk about that in a moment. But these alterations, especially when we're talking about cancers, can occur randomly, um, but they can also be a result of our environmental factors, such as um, smoking exposure, right? Or other environmental effect, uh, exposure like pollution that can alter our genes. Certain genetic disorders are inherited though. Um, when a mutated or altered gene is passed down from generation to generation. An example of this, uh, hemophilia. That is a disorder in which the blood does not clot, clot properly, and that is a genetic, genetic disorder that's passed on from generation to generation. There's also certain genetic disorders that have um, not to do with mutated genes, but with a different number of genes. Uh, the one you're probably most uh, familiar with would be Down syndrome. That has to do with a, the number of the um, gene package or chromosome being off or different, right? So genetic discrimination, you guys maybe have heard of that. That's the use of genetic information in order to exclude or discriminate against someone based on the genetic likelihood that the person may have or contract a certain disease or condition. So it's pretty amazing and pretty incredible that we can look at our DNA, our RNA, our genes, and know I might be at higher risk for a certain um, cancer or disorder, right? Pretty amazing. Um, but we don't want to be discriminated against because of our genes. We have no control over those. So the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, or GINA, protects people from genetic discrimination by insurance companies or employers. It's out there to protect us from insurance or employers using our genetic information um, against us. So something important to be aware of. Um, anatomical terms. So this is gonna be another thing that we're gonna go over in this lecture. We're gonna talk about it a little bit here, but really it's gonna take you going back to the book, looking at these images and just memorizing and getting familiar with and comfortable with. Um, anatomical terms are used to describe the locations of body parts and body regions. Um, but in order to use atomical, these anatomical terms correctly, we always have to assume that the body is in the anatomical position. Um, you guys have probably seen that image before, but essentially it's a person standing upright, facing forward with their arms at their side and palms facing forward, okay? That is the anatomical position. So you can see that, right? Oh, I. Um, not my mouse would point to it. But basically, the individual in this picture, not the woman facing to the side, but the other images on the right side of that image, they're in the anatomical position. Um, it's important to always refer to a patient as if they were in their anatomical position. This helps to prevent confusion or misunderstanding when we're communicating with our fellow healthcare providers. 
There are directional anatomical terms that are used to identify the position of body structures compared to other body structures. Um, for example, we might say the eyes are the eyes are medial to the ears, um, but they're lateral, so on the sides of the nose. Okay. Um, basically, so let's look over these here. Superior meaning above or close to the head, inferior, below or close to the feet, anterior is the front of our body, posterior is the back, medial is more closer to midline, lateral on the sides, further away from midline, proximal, close to the trunk, distal, further away. So I might say my fingers are distal or, okay, let me make that a better example. Um, if I am uh, well, yeah, no, that's a good example. My, my fingertips are distal, uh, um, distally located, I guess, because they're further away from my trunk, all right? Whereas my heart is proximal. Um, superficial is close to the surface, whereas deep is more internal. So make sure to review table 4-5 four, four in your textbook. It's on page 81 to get more comfortable and more familiar with some of these anatomical terms. There's also anatomical, anatomical body sections. Um, this is used to divide the body into sections. Again, this is used to help with making sure we're communicating clearly with our fellow healthcare uh, professionals. Make sure to review um, table 4-6 in your textbook. It's on page 82. Um, You've got the sagittal, but in general, let's talk about this. You've got the sagittal plane that divides the body into left and right. You've got the mid sagittal plane, which runs lengthwise and divides our body into equal left and right halves. Transverse plane divides the body into a superior or upper portion and inferior or lower portion. Frontal plane, which divides the body into anterior or posterior, which as we talked about in the last slide, anterior is in the front, posterior is in the back. Again, table um, or figure 4-6 four, four on page 82 in your textbook. Um, body cavities, that's the last one we're going to talk about. So body cavities in abdom well, and abdominal regions, actually. So the largest body cavities are the dorsal cavity and the ventral cavity. Take a look there. You can see the dorsal and the ventral body cavities. The dorsal cavity is divided into the cranial and spinal cavity. And the ventral cavity is divided into thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. You guys have probably heard of your diaphragm. That's what helps us breathe. Um, the diaphragm is what separates the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic cavities from each other. And the abdominal cavity, like I mentioned, is further subdivided into nine regions or four quadrants. Please be sure to review figures four, seven, and four, eight in your textbook and they're on pages 83 and 84. And that will help you to get more familiar and comfortable with um, these different body cavities and abdominal regions. Oh, there's the abdominal regions. So on the left side there, you've got the nine regions. And on the right image there, you've got your four quadrants. Those are commonly used when we're communicating with other medical professionals to describe a certain region of the body and something that you guys need to be familiar with. All right. So that is it for that lecture. Told you it was short and sweet. Um, if you have any questions, of course, let me know. And that's it for this one. Thanks, guys.